If I was a bug, I would be in my literal version of hell because I'm in a human-sized pitcher plant, which would have been slowly digesting me over the course of three days. Fortunately, pitcher plants tend to be a little bit smaller and they're not even the only way that carnivorous plants obtain nutrients to help themselves grow. So in this video, you're gonna learn all about the secrets of carnivorous plants, how to care for them properly without killing them, and how they can make you a better gardener. So it's a beautiful gloomy day. It's very foggy, very humid in here at the San Diego Botanic Garden. And I see the man I'm trying to talk to, Ari Novi, CEO. Hey Kevin. I almost slept right there, it's, it's so foggy. <laughs> Don't so sue us. I will not sue. I'm just in awe of the setup here. But before we dive into some of these environments you guys have crafted, the question has to be asked. And it's something I wondered even when I was in like maybe first grade why would a plant become carnivorous? It makes no sense. It, yeah, it's weird, but it's actually super simple. These plants all evolved in places where they have very poor ability to get nitrogen. And every gardener knows nitrogen, that's one of the big ones that the we number want. One. And you know, these plants have to come up with creative ways to get nitrogen out of the ecosystem that they're in, and they've all figured out how to eat bugs. Okay, so, so that brings you to the next obvious question is, I see this right here, this must be a, facsimile of the type of environment that, that they're in and, and what is that environment? Like why would there not be nitrogen in something like this? So one of the uh, environments where nitrogen is lacking are um, eastern freshwater bogs in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so what we've created here, even though we're in arid San Diego on top of concrete, is a facsimile of an eastern bog. And what we see here are a lot of different Saracenia pitcher plant hybrids and in some cases some straight species. And these are native to the eastern and southern United States and they are able to grow in these high acidity mm -hmm. um, bogs where the acid conditions of the water as well as a few other conditions mean that even though nitrogen is there, it is not available to the plant. Right. We actually talked about this a long time ago in Epic Gardening when I was in my hydroponic phase mm -hmm. because you're controlling the pH of your water in that situation and if you go too low or too high, you get that nutrient lockout. And these plants are effectively just in an environment where they're locked out of what may be available in nitrogen. Maybe not, but if it was, like you said, they can't get it. And so I know we have a couple other examples over here. Yes. So we're over here at a smaller exhibit, and this area is where we have, I guess, the three major categories of ways a plant can trap, which would be the sticky trap, the one we talked about with the pitchers, there's mm -hmm. two different major types there, and then of course the Venus fly trap. But I think what's drawing my eye is this little guy right here, which is a good example of the sticky trap. Yep, so this is a sundew, and what this guy is doing here is that he's got all these hairs, and they have these sweet, but really sticky kind of, you know, dew on the outsides, and an insect will get attracted to this and get stuck. I mean, yep. it's almost just like flypaper, and then this plant can then exude digestive enzymes and digest that plant without ever ever pulling it in any further than that. It doesn't like need to enclose it, much like, you know, if you were to fall on a pitcher, it's enclosed in some right. fashion, and a snap trap obviously would do the same thing. Right. It can sort of digest it where it stands. Yeah, some of the some of the sundews they actually do have the ability to kind of curl in a little bit and, and like and close wrap it. a little yeah. bit, but some of them don't, right? Because so, how would they get the the? They're basically sort of sucking the juice out of the plant or the the insect and getting the nitrogen from the proteins, right, right? Right. How would a sticky trap plant actually get that into the tissue of the plant itself? So they're just exuding these digestive enzymes yeah. that are able to break down the nitrogen containing proteins yeah. within the insect. And then they're, now they just become simple nitrogen containing components. Oh. And plants, you know, really can absorb them like just like we know. We can so spray it on the leaf. We can, it, just, yeah. it just comes into the plant and the plant yeah. is set up. It's got the architecture to absorb, wow. you know, simple nitrogen components like nitrite and um, ammonium. If you're trying to grow a sundew, what are you trying to do from a, like the classical care te right. techniques? like soil, right. you know, fertilizer, because you did mention that carnivorous plants are only carnivorous when they don't have enough nitrogen. Like they don't technically need to eat the insects if you're fertilizing. That's right. Which I did not know. That's right. Most carnivorous plants, I think all of them actually, they are perfectly capable of, of uptaking nitrogen just like every other plant does yeah. through their roots, even foliarly, but they have developed the carnivory in response to being in an environment where they don't have access yeah. to the, that nitrogen. So if you're keeping it as a house plant, um, first of all, you need to understand what, what ecosystem this plant comes from. Sundews come from the exact same ecosystem as the Saracen pitcher plants, right? Mm -hmm. So these are freshwater Bog. bogs. Yeah. Yep. So they want very high humidity, ambient humidity, yeah. and they want to be wet all the time. Yeah. Um, they can handle standing water, but you need to be careful about, you know, sort of, you know, fungus and rotting. Sure. Um, and they want a very high hummusy kind of a soil, right? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a rotted, degraded soil. And if you have that, they're fine. If you deliver them every once in a while, a tiny bit of nitrogen fertilizer, just like you would any other plant, they'll they'll be okay and yeah. they won't need to eat insects. But if there's insects around, they will eat them. All the better. Yep. Yeah. Maybe 
the most important thing is they need really clean water. So we often recommend using distilled water to water these things. Mm -hmm. And you oftentimes need them in something that's going to keep the relative humidity high, which may even mean you know, giving them a top. Like terrarium style approach, or like for me, I could perhaps do this in a greenhouse. Yes. As long as I watch out for maybe my high temps. Exactly. Cool, well that's your sundew, or your sticky trap plant, but we do have our favorite, or at least my favorite, the pitchers, which I believe you have an entire wall of over there. We got tons of them. Let's take a look. So the thing that I noticed, sorry, the first time I ever came up here was you just have a wall of these pitcher plants and you always have. These are great pitcher plants. These actually came to us. These were confiscated at the border. Yeah. And we are a plant rescue center under a treaty called the CITES Treaty, which yeah. prevents the movement of you know rare animals and plants. And so when Customs and Border Patrol and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service gets involved, they have illegally transported plants. In some situations, they will reach out to us as experts to maintain those plants in perpetuity. Yeah. And that's how these pitcher plants came to our So you sort of have like a jail lockup of plants that you'll care for yeah. indefinitely, effectively. And, exactly. And we'd like to think it's nice, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. more like a resort. So yeah, this is the Nepenthes. Mm -hmm. We have the Saracenae that were in the bog, but we have these awesome examples of the Nepenthes, which I think most people, that's what they think the pitcher plant is. That's what they most closely associate it with. Yep. But different continent of evolution, same sort of solution. Exactly, right? yeah. So these come from tropical um, Southeast Asia, yeah. you know, uh, Indonesia, the, the Malaysian archipelago, and they're you know, epiphytic up in the trees, you know, tropical plants. Whereas those um, Saracenia pitchers, they're on the ground, bog, mm -hmm. temperate North American plants. But yeah. same solution to that same problem. Both of those yeah. places have limited nitrogen. And That's so different plants make, created similar solutions. It's actually really wild to think about that because in the bog, no nitrogen because of lockout perhaps or, yes. or low nitrogen content in general yes. up in the air next to the tree obviously no soil to really draw it from but then still coming up with the same solution which of course is this pitfall style trap and and the thing that i noticed perhaps for the first time even today mm -hmm. was that you've got this leaf mm -hmm. and i never connected that actually the pictures come off the leaf they have this weird sort of tenderly looking thing and then it just turns into a pitcher at the end. Yep. I don't think I've ever seen something with like two more structures after the leaf. It's very unusual. The, the Technically speaking, the pitcher here is a modified leaf structure. Yeah. So you have a bud way back here by the stem. Yeah. And then this whole thing is the leaf organ that's capable of producing that tendril to pitcher. And then it is exuding some sort of liquid mm -hmm. from the bottom, I, I think here, right? Or through the tissue. Yep. Filling it up, which we'll open this one up in just a second here. And then both the sort of scent of that and then the visual appeal, I suppose, is what causes something to come in. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's fascinating. You know, they have so many adaptations that make it so that the insect is attracted mm -hmm. and then gets caught. Um, and, you know, from the colors to some little hairs to slippery surfaces to yeah. attractive smells. And then once they get into that liquid that's exuded by the plant, it's got these digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. The insect gets caught, it dies, digested, and the nitrogen comes out and is absorbed by the plant. Because there's, I mean, you're right. Like, even it's to the smallest degree because you have this little sort of tightening mm -hmm. right here. It's wide here, it's tight here, it's wide again here. Big base, maybe a lot of surface area to digest. And then up here, oops, can't get out. Yep. And you were even mentioning in this tighter zone on the interior, if you look, some Sometimes there's these little sort of pieces coming out, almost like uh, kind of like going back over a like don't reverse your car on exactly. the tires yep. thing. They like you just they, can't get back yep. out. They're often sort of yeah. angled a little down. Just all these little things that yeah. that make it so that that insect's going to go in there and get trapped. So should we open this one up? Yeah, let's do okay. it. Okay. So what's the best way? Oh, oh, you know what? One more thing before we do that. This little what, what would be the function? I know that we saw down here. There's a couple that have yet to open. Yep. So and that's basically the top popping that's, off, right? That's right. So this is the pitcher as it's forming, you yeah. know, from that bud off of the leaf. And so it's got to control its internal environment until it's ready um, to digest. So it's kind of like I'm closed for business. Boom. The crack of the beer. Opens up, <laughs> yeah. And now I'm ready. Yeah. And then it sort of turns into this nice little, little flap. Yeah. Really fascinating. Okay. So how should we open this? Just kind of yeah, rip it open? Just kind of rip it down. Yeah. You want to do the honors? Sure. My pleasure. Right, so you'll see there's there's this liquid right in the bottom, right, and this is not rainfall, right? This is actively liquid that's being exuded. Yeah, because we're in a greenhouse, plant. it can't even rain. Nope. And then this plant has been collecting ants. Look, I mean, look how many ants that's are in a, there. That's incredible. These are all getting digested. They, it won't digest their exoskeletons, which are made of chitin, but everything else will liquefy, and all that nitrogen will get sucked up into the plant. 
almost like a constantly applied foliar feed, right? Because as soon as it gets into that solution, it's just smacking right into the plant exactly. tissue, going straight into the It's a nice, plant. slow release yeah. nitrogen on the, on, the, on the foliar tissue. So when it comes to care of Nepenthes, I have Saracenia, mm -hmm. but um, if I'm wanting to care for pictures, which I do, what do I need to keep in mind? So, you know, unlike the Cyrocinias, these come from tropical rainforests. And instead of being rooted in the ground as terrestrial plants, these are epiphytes. They're growing up on trees in the tropical rainforest, very similar to orchids. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have been cultivating, humans have been cultivating tropical Cyrocinias as houseplants since, you know, the Victorian age. They were status symbols along with orchids at that time. Mm. They want a lot of the same conditions that orchids want, right? They're going to be in an orchid type media. They're going to be, you know, attached to barks, you know, you know, things that are like a tree. They want, you know, good good ambient humidity, um, and they don't want a lot of fertilization or anything else. They're going to grow slow and they're going to kind of take care of themselves if you get the humidity situation correct. Yeah, it really seems like with a lot of these plants, it's getting the humidity and the moisture conditions right mm -hmm. um, for these sort of esoteric uh, otter, otter ones. And we're actually going to the least odd one or the most familiar one, certainly one that I tried to grow when I was in maybe like third or fourth grade, Ari, and then I killed it yep. within maybe a week, and that would be, of course, the Venus flytrap. So here we are, Ari, in my third grade child's dream garden right here. This is what I would have loved. Yeah, I mean, these are just the most amazing plants. I felt the same way as a kid. I mean, these plants just hang out and they wait for flies to go in there and they have this amazing mechanism of these hairs. Mm -hmm. And if a fly or other insect triggers multiple hairs, it snaps rapidly, mm -hmm. which is an amazing adaptation to get at that nitrogen that is locked up in these flying insects. Yeah, because they'll, they'll basically become a pitcher at that point in time, right? Because it's fully enclosed and then they excrete some sort of liquid to digest and then they'll open back up. And I think the question, and something I wondered even as a kid is like, how would it know that it needs to close? And then the second follow-up would be, how would it close if it knew it needed to close, right? So there are trigger hairs all throughout the interior of these plants. And if, if the insect comes and can trigger multiples of them, it closes rapidly. It closes rapidly. Really quickly. And yeah. you see those really cool kind of like, you know, lashes almost on the edge of yeah, them. That yeah. means that even a relatively small, you know, movement gets that gets that insect stuck. Right, oh, that's a good point. So if, if it did not have the lashes, you could fly out reasonably quick, but right. if it, let, me, here, let me trigger this big one here. So I'll hit one hair, nothing happens. Oh, there we go, I hit the second one. So it didn't need to close, it, I, I would say less than a couple milliseconds, at least the two lashes met. Exactly. Because it's actually not fully, fully closed. No, it'll it'll kind of, you know, it has a one initial quick close yeah. that gets those lashes there. So that- And then it like constricts. Now it's gonna yeah. constrict, now it's gonna, and then it eventually, as it feels that insect struggling, it'll it'll start uh, to release those, um, those digestive enzymes. And this isn't a feature unique to the Venus flytrap, because in fact, there's something else in this greenhouse that has this function. That's right. So we call when plants can move as a result of touch, yeah. thigmotropism. Okay. And that's, that's in some other plants too that we can take a look at. Let's go look. So here we are at a plant I actually have grown from seed. So a little little cred on my name here, but this is the Mimosa pudica or the sensitive plant or the tickle me plant, I guess is what some people call it. And the way I remember it, Ari, is if you sort of pinch the end here, there you go. And you can do it faster, but to me, that's very satisfying to watch that happen. They're, these are amazing. Yeah. And just like the Venus flytrap, although for a different purpose, this plant is translating a sensory impulse into mm -hmm. a ra relatively rapid movement of closure. So why is this one doing this? What, what would be the purpose? I can't quite figure it out myself. Well, the idea is anti-herbivory, right? Yeah. So that if there's an insect on there that's big enough that's starting to munch on that plant, it feels that and it closes and that kind of scares the insect off. Oh. Maybe even a larger animal that we can think of as grazing. I mean, once you once you close this off, there doesn't look like there's a lot left. Mm. And if you're like a, if you can imagine a, a larger animal moving through a, a shrub ah, of this, mm -hmm. it just all of a sudden gets small. Interesting. Let's help myself back in third grade, but also everyone watching, how would I best care for these? And this is a really interesting setup, just straight out of the gate. Yeah, we really wanted to be able to show the, the live Venus flytraps next to this awesome sculpture. And you know, th these grow in the same kind of bogs as the Saracenias mm -hmm. and the Sundews, right? So they want really clean water again, right? So distilled water, You've gotta be really careful, especially here in San Diego, if you've got, you know, kind of high salty, you know, water. And they really want that ambient humidity as well. The soils can never dry out. We didn't wanna cover them with glass, put them in a terrarium because we wanted them a little more visible. So we're using all this great moss, which we wet down every day mm -hmm. to make sure that this local environment, microclimate stays very humid. Okay, so basically, if I wanted to replicate this at home, I could effectively mimic this 
put some moss on or something that's moisture retentive, but only water it with distilled, mm -hmm. which honestly with my Saracenia, which is in the Epic Greenhouse right now, I'm sprinkling from whatever we have water hooked up from the city. So probably not long for this world. You know, you gotta, be, you gotta be careful. Rain, yeah. rain water is great too. Yeah. I mean, the tricky thing with distilled water is you're giving it no nutrient. So mm -hmm. over time that will catch up with you too. So you have to find a, a, the balance. Rain water is probably best. Okay. Um, if you have it, you know, again, here in San Diego, not easy to get a lot of rain. Either, yeah. um, but distilled water is a good place to start. And I, I think for beginners, completely enclosed is best. Just go terrarium. Yep. Okay. Most forgiving. So, so much to know about carnivorous plants. Absolutely fascinating. But I think the through line for me as just mostly an edibles gardener is study the plant, study where the plant came from, look at the plant, observe it, and then that will in help you infer how to care for it. And you can use that not only with carnivorous, which I'm probably gonna build a carnivorous terrarium now, but uh, with all the other things you grow. So thanks for having us, Ari. Really appreciate it. Thanks to you guys for watching. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.